Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Kelly Shields. Kelly Shields is a career and life coach for stressed, unhappy professionals who feel stuck in careers that make them miserable. She helps them get clarity on what they need to find meaning and enjoyment in their work so they can successfully pivot into careers they love. Before launching her coaching business, Kelly spent 12 years as an outwardly successful, inwardly unhappy corporate attorney. She lives in Arlington, Virginia with two fluffy orange cats and enjoy making surprise appearances on client calls. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Kelly. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Thank you, Dwight. I'm really happy to be here. Yes, I'm excited for this conversation. As I mentioned before we started recording, I was going through your site and reading some of your story, and I'm looking forward to delving into it. I think there's uh, so many nuggets of information that you're going to be able to share to help my listeners and people that watch the podcast, you know, level up their lives and stop being camped and start climbing again. Uh, That's something I coach and teach on. We get stuck in a rut. We get stuck on a hamster wheel, and so many people camp and they don't even realize they're camped they don't even realize why that camping leads to addiction issues it leads to depression it leads to anxiety it leads to so many different things so i'm really excited to uh learn more about what it is exactly that you had as a self-discovery and where you've taken that and how it's helping so many people in the world today so kelly one of the things i focus on though is a person's origin story from the time that they're of their earliest recollections up to where they are today because really we're defined by our origin and people don't take it serious enough they always think well that's in the past you know that's not indicative of where i am today well that's not true what our parents talk to us about, what our parents taught us, friends, family, youth group, churches, school, everything affects us. And until we have that realization, which I know you have after reading your stuff, that's why I'm so excited to hear your origin story. So please tell me what key things from your childhood to adulthood that led you to where you're at currently. Ooh, I love that you are starting with this and origin stories because it is such a big deal and impacts so many of us in so many different ways. You know, for me, um, I was somebody who, even as a small child, like when I first started school, I, I just always really enjoyed school and I was really good at it. And I, my mom had even, even kind of pre real recollection. She'd like, played like memory games with me and done stuff that was supposed to help develop my brain. So I know she cared a lot about school and doing well at school, which I mean, it's great. That's a wonderful thing to do well at, but that kind of became a big part of my identity almost just, oh, I was really good at school. I got good grades. I was the smart kid. And as an adult, I would like to pause and say, I kind of, I, I do think I'm smart, but I really do have a problem with using being good at school with a proxy for intelligence. Um, being good at school is being good at school. There are amazingly intelligent people doing amazing things in the world whose school just was not set up for them to thrive in. But I grew up in that. I, that's how I grew up like many other people with, oh, you're, you're good at school. You're going to be quote unquote, a success, meaning 
keep doing good at school, keep getting good grades, then you're going to go to college and you're going to get a scholarship to college, you're going to excel at college, and then you're going to go into the, some field where you're going to make a good living that's prestigious and you're going to then have a good life. And it's kind of something that I think of and other people I know think of as, oh, kind of getting funneled into the smart kid path. That's sounds that in many ways is great. I mean, I did end up in a job that at least paid me well, but it didn't really, there wasn't really any taking into account, oh, you know, what's unique about me? Is this actually the right path for me? Or is this just, oh, well, great. You can get a job this way. You can support yourself. You can have a, what society deems as a successful life. And I also have to say that I wasn't a big fan of the town where I grew up in. And I don't mean to knock it for anyone who has stayed there, but I was in a small city in Kentucky and I really wanted to leave. Um, I, I remember even being in, you know, middle school, um, just not really loving my hometown and really wanting to leave, really wanting to try something new. So I embraced that narrative as well, voluntarily in the sense that I just was like wanting to get out, wanting to move to a bigger city or move to someplace that I found more interesting or had the impression of was more interesting. I don't know that as a middle school, high school, or college student, I had any actual information about when he, what any of those other places would be like. But I followed that path. I kept doing all the right and responsible things. And so I studied hard. I worked hard. I got good grades. I thought I thought about what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be an engineer, although it did take me a while to figure that one out because everyone said it was a good job and that would have been the world's worst fit for me. <laughs> um, but I was like, oh, I, I like writing. I like talking. I, yeah, I'm smart. Um, I should go be a lawyer. And so I went to law school. Um, I guess I'm going a little bit beyond my earliest origin story here, but it all just kind of flowed from, oh, great. I have these talents. This is, this is what I do. This is the path that society says, great. This is the ideal path. You can actually get into it. So this is what you should do. And unfortunately I figured out about two thirds of the way through law school before I even graduated, that this was going to be a terrible fit for me. And yet I was approaching six figures in student debt already at that point. <laughs> So suddenly felt very trapped. Oh, imagine you would have. It's uh, I find that it's so prevalent, even with myself um, or my kids that have gone through school. My one daughter stayed in university longer than she should have, and it acquired massive amounts of debt. One day she came upstairs and she said, Dad, I I can't do it anymore. I've I've changed my major. I've gone from this to this and thinking that maybe it would trigger something in me and it just doesn't, I'm going to quit. And my knee jerk thing inside my six inches was to say, what, what are you doing? You know how much money you've invested in student loans, but I bit my lip and I said, well, honey, you need to do whatever your path is telling you to do. Like whatever your journey in life is, I'm here to support you. It's unfortunate that, you know, because she mentioned her, her money situation. I said, it's unfortunate you're in that circumstance. I'll do what I can to help you out of it, but you need to find your, your path. You need to figure it out. So I, I can respect what you're saying. A lot of people would continue to can, have continued to push forward. I know so many people that have, and then I, I actually wrote something in my notes here for a uh, uh, you know, a further question, but we'll dive into that now. I know in Canada and in the U.S., it's as high as 65 to 70 percent of people that graduate from university or college. They never, ever work in that field, but they feel like they have to finish their degree or their diploma because of the investment of money. What they re don't realize is the loss of their life, the loss of their, their time. Time is in session. This is not a dress rehearsal. We lose that time and the pressure from family and friends saying, oh, just finish, you know, things will change. You'll go do it and you'll love it. And oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, it, it's just the pressures that we feel are unbelievable Absolutely. When it comes because of student loans and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, I, I, before we get it, dive into that conversation of your debt, because that is the next thing I wanted to get into. I like the fact that you talked about good at school does not equate to intelligence. Listeners really feel that statement, right? Because I feel it in my chest. Going to school doesn't make you smart. I remember growing up with the kids that were getting honors and they were, you know, the class um, teacher's pet or whatever. And I was BC student. It wasn't that I wasn't intelligence. They couldn't keep my attention span. I was actually, sometimes people like myself are more intelligent because we're dreaming beyond the scope of a textbook, if that makes sense. Right. So I love that statement. You want to dive into that more? Yeah, just for at least for a minute. I mean, I happen to be somebody who learns really well in the way that school is set up. I learn really well when somebody is teaching me and being in an environment with other people around is something that's energizing to me. So great. I could listen to what teachers were saying. I was energized to pay attention because I was in that situation. I mean, I am smart. I've found most people I know are actually quite smart now that I'm an adult Um, and it has absolutely (laughs) nothing to do with their degrees or or history in school, but there's so many types of different types of learning styles and you can be brilliant, but if you have, um, if you're a kinesthetic learner or, you know, and so many different types of learning styles, you're almost being set up to fail by just this one size fits all educational system. And I think that can really have an impact on how you view yourself and your identity, your self-worth, self-esteem. And it's really unfortunate because it's really more of, I mean, I think there are wonderful teachers and I do know more teachers now who are actively trying to engage students in different styles of learning so that they can learn better. But oh, that's just sad to me that like somehow you, you know, I was valedictorian. Did that mean I was smarter than other people in my school? Not necessarily. Um, it meant I did well in school and well, I learned well, how to do that. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, I have mad respect for teachers. My sister's That's, a teacher. My cousin's a teacher. I know a lot of teachers. I have yep. clients that are teachers. The school system, though, in North America and really around the world is broken because yes. it is structured to pat people on the back that get an A, but then little Johnny or Sally sitting four rows back might be just as intelligent, but yet they have family strife going on. They have trials and tribulation. There's violence issues. There's addiction issues. Maybe they're not getting their hearing stuff or not getting proper nutrition. So they're, they're already got an anchor on their back at a young age. They don't have the right um, environment for them to achieve absolutely but then again I know people that have done all that and then they get into young adulthood and they manage to break those chains weren't good in school that are some of the most intelligent people Mm -hmm. I know and so successful I have it on both sides I have people that have gone through school such as yourself that are extremely successful too but people label those that are valedictorians or honor students as the smartest and brightest people on the planet. And I have found through experience that not to be the case. Sometimes the C and D students end up shining and flourishing. They just need coaching. They need yes. mentorship, which we'll get into. That's part. I, I, <laughs> I've read lots about you. And <laughs> so I get you, I get this, I get that you understand what I'm saying. I want to make sure that the conversation flows that the listeners understand we're not here to cut down the education system. No. The education system is wonderful. The people within it are wonderful. There's cracks and, and fissures throughout any form of, of industry. And the school system needs to stop and reflect and start working on people six inches between their ears, help them with the challenges they're facing so that they can go home more happier so that they can come back to school. Maybe that's the only happiness they have. Yeah. In their lives. Yeah. Right? And I mean, problem. I'm thank you, thank you for pausing and just emphasizing that. I, I agree. I I think anyone who is a teacher, I could not do that job. That is no, one of the I. most demanding jobs that involves investing. I mean, yes, I have nothing but the deepest respect for teachers. And I also think that they're under-resourced. I think that, you know, so much is about you have, they have so many students that they're not getting paid enough. They don't have enough time. I mean, well, and the students bring their problems to school. 
Yeah. Right. Through behavioral problems. Then the parents bring it to school and, you know, little Johnny or Sally are having problems and they get, you know, the teachers have to take the blunt of not under, you know, why did you do this? And why did you do that? Well, little Johnny did this or little Sally did this. Well, you have no clue because I've heard it experienced at all. If you, you know, it's just, it's, it's sad. The pressures that a teacher has to go through. Yes. So I definitely respect them a hundred percent. It's not them. That's the issue. It's the curriculum. It's the people above sitting in their, in their desks that aren't even on the ground floor boots to the ground that don't understand it, that are laying out a curriculum that doesn't in, involve um, growth. It doesn't yeah. involve personal development. It doesn't involve so many different things. And they teach things still today that you'll never use once you get out of school. Yeah. When's the, when's the last time in your career did you use calculus? Um, you know, as an attorney, I did actually use algebra and latitude and longitude. So I throw that out, out every as, once in a while, but you as, never know. As, but you're not an attorney anymore, though. That's true. I'm not. <laughs> so when's the last time you used it? Oh, I mean, (laughs) it's been a while. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not saying that some of the things, you know, that we learn, like some of the things we learned in science class or how to, you know, calculate mass and volume and stuff. I don't use that anymore. No, no, no. No, So my point is, is we'll go on from there. There's lots of things that the school system can learn to change and develop that your intelligence isn't based in the fact of whether or not you're an honor student or valedictorian but kudos to you for doing that because you still had to put your boots to the ground you had to put in the effort and hard work to get there that didn't Mm -hmm. come just by you waking up one day and that and you know they put that little award in your hand (laughs) and a little badge on your chest that just doesn't happen so that's that's kudos to you that's a lot of hard work um but so many people just equate, you know, this yeah. person, this person was an honor student. They're smarter than everybody else in the class. No, that's not the case. Right. Exactly. So Kelly, you finished law school in extreme debt. We, this already come up to the tune of six figures, three of my five kids, as I mentioned, have you know, gone through that same p- position. Some of them are still going through it where it has a tremendous mental stress on a person. What did this debt do to your mental state of mind after school? And was it a catalyst for you staying in a job you struggle to do daily longer than you should have? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Um, the I had so much stress because of the debt. And I think now looking back, if I would have known to get a counselor or a coach or specifically someone who could help me with my thinking about the debt. Um, That would have been a game changer for me. I know that I got very stuck in a very destructive thought pattern of I have all this debt. I'm trapped. I have to stay working for a law firm. I hate working for a law firm, but I have all this debt and it just went in a circle. And I don't think I needed to suffer nearly as much as I did. I think a lot of my suffering came because of the way I was thinking about things. And I didn't at that point in my life have the tools to take a different perspective um, or interrupt those thought, those thought processes and take you know, a healthier perspective that would have acknowledged that I still had debt and maybe chosen to work in a law firm, but been able to realize it was for a season and have much more, feel much more empowered and that I had much more agency in my choices. Um, I did. I'm, I'm very thankful. I did at least work once I, I did at least work to find a law firm that I could work for that. I liked the people at a great deal. Um, it was like, I have nothing bad to say about the law firm I ended up working for, for four years. I think the people were wonderful. Um, They were very supportive and I even had better hours than most attorneys do, but the work for me was a very bad fit because it was so isolated. Actually, that almost sums it up. It wasn't using most of the strengths that energized me. It wasn't, the situation wasn't one in which I could even be creative. Sticking me in an office by myself with a computer and just leaving me alone to while that that's a terrible situation for me to come up with my most effective thinking, creative thinking, problem solving. And so kind of 
even just the physical setup of what's involved in being a liar, um, especially at that time before, I think maybe during or post pandemic, there's going to be more um, ability to work someplace like a coffee shop or not be in the office. But at that point, being in the office was more of an expectation. So yeah, it just was a very bad fit for my personality, from the strengths I wanted to use. And honestly, I wasn't that interested in it as it turned out. I thought I would be, but I basically tell people now that what I didn't realize was that being a lawyer is basically like being an accountant, but with words. So it's very detailed. You're digging through a lot of dense information, doing a lot of research, trying to find some very particular nugget of information that has to be from a case that comes out the right way, that happened in the right location, and you have to fit those together. Um, It is better if you like words because there are things about structuring arguments, and I did like counseling clients on how to solve their problems. I did enjoy that part, but I was really unhappy. I very quickly... I mean, I think because of the thought process I was discussing earlier, I very quickly developed um, depression and did not know how to get out of that. And that continued for like three years um, through two very difficult jobs. And I just didn't know. It definitely kept me feeling stuck that I had no choice but to work at a law firm and pay off my loans And what I also didn't expect after that was um, that I would feel, oh, wait, now I'm only qualified to be a lawyer. So now I have to continue as a lawyer. So you labeled Um, yourself. Yes, 100%. And I've talked to other people who are lawyers, but I think this happens in a lot of um, cases where, but I only have experience as a insert your profession and they feel like that means that's all that they can do. And it's not true, but many of us fall into that thinking trap. Well, yeah. And it's true though, but it's back to what you mentioned about, uh, you know, I read it on your site too, and mentorship and coaching, right from high school, it's important, but even when we're in our career, so, you know, you were stuck in that rut of labeled as a lawyer thinking that you couldn't do anything else yet if you had had mentorship and coaching to make you think differently to like my friend Michelle that I mentioned that she she literally takes people through a why process so why do you why are you a lawyer why do you want to do it and literally drill down to the point where people will get that light bulb aha moment and really if you had been questioned and asked sooner by somebody I know for myself I had a mentor coach reach out to me in 2002 I was computer consultant at a consultant firm I had a retail computer company and I was fairly successful yet I wasn't satisfied I was having health issues and they said to me you know what we think you'd be better in the finance industry Mm -hmm. well are computers and finance anywhere close to one another? No, it's like the polar opposites. It's like the North and South Pole. And I was like, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Well, they brought, well, they put it very simplistic to me. You're great with people. You're, you're good at building relationships. You're good at, you're very, you can articulate yourself very well. You're very good at teaching people and relating to them. And all the strengths I had that really, they said, you can take any of those strengths and put them in any career. But we think you'd be great in this career. Why don't you come check it out and we'll give you some guidance. Um, You know, long story short, I ended up leaving that industry completely. And I've been gone from that industry for this is my 20 going into my 20th year, because I had a mentor or coach. So can you talk about how mentorship and coaching has made a huge impact on your life? Absolutely. I'm Yes, exactly as big a fan as you are of mentoring and coaching. And I will throw in counseling as well. Um, they are different, but I think all of them have a role and are can be very important. Well, as a side note on counseling, I think everybody in society should be have access to free counseling minimum once a month, the rest of their freaking life. A lot of our world strife and problems, our family strife and problems, our local communities, all our relationship issues could be fixed if we had some counseling. I love that. 
100%. I love that plan. 100% love that plan. I have said for ages that I think everyone needs to go to counseling just because I think everyone needs to. I, I would, yes, I'm 100% on board with your, you know, once a month free counseling for everybody. That's yeah. great. Let's, let's find a way to make that happen in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we'll start a petition now. <laughs> um, I, I'm so on board. Um, but I think that those things helped me realize what was possible for me and that I wasn't trapped. And they helped me start recognizing the ways that my own thinking was limiting me and start thinking in some more expansive ways. Um, and then ultimately make a huge life change in you know leaving being a corporate attorney behind after 12 years and realizing, you know, what would actually be a great fit for me is myself being, you know, a counselor or a coach, but I didn't want to go back to school for years and years and years before I could start working and helping people. Um, so I went the coaching route. I would not have been able to do that period without having wonderful coaching um, from somebody who really knew what they were talking about and who could really support me. I'm, I had tried, I had thought about this for a long, I'd thought about it for, since I'd been unhappy, but even though I took assessments and read books and, you know, had, had conversations, I didn't know how to make that happen. And I also didn't know how to really get clear on what would actually be a good fit career for me. Um, on my own, I actually had thought that being a realtor would be a good fit for me. And I don't think that would be a terrible fit for me now, but I got my license and tried working with someone I know who has a very small real estate brokerage and quickly found that I was going to have to switch and go work full time for like a big real estate company. If I wanted to do that, I was not motivated to do it at all. And I couldn't understand, well, why am I not motivated to do this? My best friend from college had literally said, oh, I think that's the perfect job for you. And I thought it made so much sense. But what I didn't realize at that point, and this touches on something we mentioned a little bit before we started recording too, but that came down to my why, um, my personal values and motivators. And I worked with a coach who helped me realize that, oh, there's a structured way you can start thinking about what you actually want to be doing with your career to meet your needs and everyone's needs are different. So, you know, what I needed is going to be very different from someone else. But for me, I really needed something that was more alignment with my why, with my values, with my motivators. And one of my core values is an idea that I think of as making things right. And to me, work should be a good part of our lives. It should be something where, yeah, it's, we work. It's not necessarily just like, you know, unicorns and rainbows and nothing's ever hard, but we can use our strengths. We can invest and see results. We can grow. We can end the day feeling like, oh, I, I worked and I accomplished something or I worked towards something. Even if that something is I'm providing for my family, which is a very valuable, you know, which is incredibly valuable reason and motivation but you're not leaving drained. You're not, it's not taking over your life. It's not impacting your health negatively. It's not leaving you miserable. It's not driving you to alcohol or drugs or addictive behaviors. It's not making you choose between keeping your job and showing up for your kids or your spouse or your friends, or just even your own life. It should be something that is a part of our lives that is good. And I think it's wrong when that's not happening. And so the work I do now is something that in part came out of that, that why, that core value. That processing, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's it's so important to realize people listening that coaches, mentors, counselors are people that are seeing the forest for the trees. They're, they're literally not going to, they're going to be what I tell my, tell a lot of people. I'll say, do you want me to tell you what a friend would tell you? Or do you want me to tell you the truth? And they get shocked by that. Well, what do you mean? Because a lot of times friends and family will tell us what they think we want to hear, not what we need to hear. And, that, and the harsh reality of it is a mentor or a coach or a counselor is there to listen 
and help you work through and find a solution from yourself. They're not necessarily giving you the, the solution. They're, they're hopefully drawing it out of you because that's what I find is the best coach is somebody that's challenging you. Yes, they can have advice. You know, here's some options for you, Kelly. Here's what we think might, you know, here's what I think might work for you. And then Kelly gets to percolate think about that and have it, you know, think about it for minutes, hours, days, Mm -hmm. and then come back, have another conversation, you know, like, you know, how coaching works can be once every couple of weeks, can be once a week, it can be daily for some people when they're really struggling. But I appreciate you sharing about that, that it did, it did make a huge difference and impact in your life and led you to where you're doing it yourself, which is phenomenal. I, I, you know, you mentioned real estate and, somebody's saying, you know, again, friend told you what you wanted to hear, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They might not even really believe that. And it's because people don't want to offend their friends and family. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, try this out. And sometimes it's because they know somebody else that was successful in that career. And it's always about finance. It's always about money. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kelly's got student loans. Kelly's not really happy. Kelly needs to make good money. Oh, it's, you know, she'd be a great fit for being a realtor yet. They really don't know Kelly. They know the, they know the superficial facade of Kelly, but they don't know what's going on between your six inches. And I still think that's why coaching and mentorship is so important. A good coach or mentor is going to drill down to that and peel back the layers. Yeah. I think that you are nailing it. That's exactly nobody else can tell you just looking at you. Oh, here's, here's the answer for your, for you. Um, I'm thinking of this in the world of work and that's what we're talking about, but nobody else can look at you and just say, Hey, here's absolutely what you should be doing. Um, they can make suggestions and give you the reasons why they think it might be a good fit, but that's the difference between talking to a friend or just talking to somebody else who used to work. I see so many posts on Facebook or in different communities where someone wants to find out what other people who are in their career field, say healthcare or teaching or anything, HR, anything like, oh, is anyone else used to be in there? And what did you change into? Or they're asking, oh, what careers do other people here enjoy? I'm just trying to figure that out. It's not bad. I don't, I would never criticize somebody for getting information. I think that's really helpful, but the problem is those people aren't you what worked for them is not necessarily going to work for you. So to really figure out what's right for you, I really think that the best investment you can make, my goodness, I would have saved years and years of my life if I would have invested in coaching before I did. And I mean, it's sometimes people look at it and say, oh, this is kind of expensive, but it's so much less expensive than a grad degree or getting a license or switching a job into a job that you think you're going to like, and then realizing, oh, this is a terrible fit for me. It's yeah. Like, well, like- you, you get to a point where you know, all of a sudden one day you, you think to yourself, I wish I had me as, as a young adult, yeah. <laughs> I, the person I am today. Yes. Right. And it's not, it's not an ego thing. It's just that, my gosh, I've learned so much along the journey of my life and and the hills and valleys and living in the valley of despair. And then, you know, having the highs and lows that if I could talk to my younger self, I've had uh, being a guest on podcasts, I've been asked that question. What would you tell your younger self? I tell my younger self that not to go get a coach or mentor necessarily, not that that's bad. I tell my younger self to listen to this listen to my heart listen to me quit listening to all the noise quit listening to all the wah 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 that's going on in the world and our you know you you touched on that too though like our families again love my family but so many of us get labeled well you'd be really good at that you know you'd be really good at you know do what your dad's doing, do what your mom's doing, do what your uncle, look at your uncle, Bob, he got into this and he was so successful. Why don't you do that? And, and, and none of these people are doing it to hurt us, but sometimes we just got to ask the right people. And it's back to the mentorship and coaching, even school counselors, right? Sometimes yeah. I'm not saying they're all good, but not all coaches and mentors are good either. But, you know, so I have some young listeners, I have 18, 19 year old listeners 
Um, I'll have to tell you that story someday. It's the listeners have heard it already um, prior in discussions and stuff. But I have young listeners that need to hear this sort of stuff. Start with your school counselor. If you're hearing things from your family that make you have a pit in your stomach, you feel your chest getting tight, which is a, a trigger for, uh, it can be a trigger for anxiety or depression, go talk to somebody different, right? Yeah. You can nod your head at your mom and your dad, or you're, even if you're an adult and your mom and dad are telling you stuff or friends or family, it's okay to just politely listen and walk away and agree to disagree right? You can, you don't have to be vocal that you disagree with them. Sometimes it's kindness is still the champ and you can still do what you want to do. (laughs) You can still go find somebody and get help. And that person doesn't have to know when they know, when they find out is when you've figured out your path and you've decided what you're going to do and you become successful at it because you're tenacious and you just do whatever it takes. Right. So. Um, I just want to pause on that and hope and just emphasize for any listeners that you have who are in college age thinking about these things, this is fantastic advice. So please pause and check in with yourself and pay attention to how you're, please just please follow Dwight's advice here because you will be setting yourself up for a life that you actually really want to be living if you follow his advice. And your parents love you, all your friends love you, but they can't know what's going to be best and right for you on your path. Yeah, exactly. And if you're an older, you know, you're not early young adult and you're, you're in your thirties or late twenties and your forties or whatever, it's never too late to give a heck about yourself. It's never too late to say, you know what? Damn, I've been spending the last five, 10, 15 years of my life stuck in a rut I'm making good money, but I'm not emotionally and satisfied and mentally satisfied because all the money in the world means nothing Mm -hmm. if you're not happy and money doesn't, you know, money can assist in memories, but it can assist in buying you happiness And, and a memory can be a temporary happiness. And then if you go back into that career or business or job that you're, you're just going to work, go home, get paid, stuck on that hamster wheel, that's not fun. It's, and, you know, another thing I want to tell people that are listening, it's okay to not know exactly what you want to do once you come out of school, right? Even if it's high school, if it's college, university, it's okay. Oh, you're, you're in a job for 10 years and you're not sure where you want to go. You've been offered a career path change or a promotion and you're not sure. It's okay to say to people too, you know what, I need to take a pause. I need to figure out some things. and then self-internalize but the biggest thing a coach and mentor can do is help you by questioning you so that you think differently and they're not you don't have to be stuck in a rut there's always hope for everybody for everybody look at at you and i i've pivoted you pivoted Mm -hmm. i've pivoted more than once and it's and so have you you went from one law firm to a corporate gig Mm -hmm. to leaving and being coaching yeah you're constantly elevating and climbing once in a while you've camped but yep. you realized that the investment in yourself is talking to others, right? Which oh. is amazing. I love what I love that you're what you're putting out there for your listeners. Um, I have clients who are in their fifties, and it is not too late. Um, I mean, my goodness, um, I wish I remembered the ages off the top of my head. But Julia Child, I think, didn't even start cooking school until thirty-seven or thirty-nine. So, I mean it's just not too late. And the idea of, there's an idea about, oh, well, it's too late. And I just want people to hear that. I've heard that from people who are in their 26, 27 years old, um, as well as people who are 55. It's really, there's no objective reality. It's about a perception of where we're supposed to be. And a coach can also really help you with that. Even if you have 10 years left until you retire, assuming you even want a traditional retirement, um, that's a large percentage of your adult life. And there's no need to use your words, stay camped someplace that you're miserable. You can still pivot from where you are into something that you know meets your needs where you are at that point, which might be different than if you're 25, but that helps you start climbing again and help you start giving a heck about your life and feeling good again. And well, you live longer too when you're yeah. when you're 
satisfied and satiated. Everybody talks about satiation being like nutrition. Well, your mind needs nutrition, right? Yeah. Your emotional state of being needs nutrition. So you can be 60, 70 years old. It doesn't matter. I have listeners that are in all age categories from teens all the way up into their 80s. And, you know, sometimes in life, we just don't be camped. Now, if that's where you're enjoying life and you're in that re traditional retirement, as, as you mentioned, Kelly, myself, I'm going to keep on climbing till the day I take my last breath because, and, it, and people say, what, is, what does that mean for you? You're never going to retire? And I told somebody that just in the last few weeks, I said, yeah, I'm never going to retire. Well, I want to retire. I want to do this and do that. I said, you know what, just based on my experience and talking to people and coaching them and talking to retired people in my finance and coaching business, they literally are bored after eight mm. months, a year. Some people make it two, three years because you can only sit on a beach. You can only travel so much. If you're not doing something in between, in my opinion, that satisfies you in a different realm. And then you have that goal of going on that month vacation or doing whatever, or, you know, something outside of work. It, it be, you're on a hamster wheel in retirement too. It may sound harsh, but you can be on that hamster wheel. And then people wonder why they have health issues, yeah. longevity issues, because their, their brain gets camped. Our brain is something that needs to be fed every single day, some sort of new information, because if it's not, we get camped. And, you know, I, I, I wish I would have had again, like we talked about you and I both wish we would have had this information back in high school going into college. But again, we have it now we continue to pivot and elevate, you're helping people, which is fantastic, because your story is amazing. And I'm doing the same. Mm -hmm. And there's no shortage of people that need help. Right? Absolutely. They and can reach by the out way, to us. By the way, if you're saying like, oh, well, I want to do X when I retire, that's great. I would just question, you know, there's a lot of opportunities now. Like, is this something that absolutely, like, what can you bring into your life now? Like, don't defer, like, don't put off all of your happiness. Oh, I have to put my head down and just work, be at the grindstone. For the next 20, 30 years. The next 20, 30 years. years. Yeah, that's just... Like, there's all sorts of things that you can do now and ways you can change your life now that maybe aren't, you know, oh, I'm never going to work again, but I'm a, for some people, I'm a huge fan of sabbaticals or work breaks to either travel or learn something or rest. I certainly took one because I needed to recover my health. Yeah. Um, for other people, I mean, if you want, it's so easy now to go um, be a digital nomad and work from a beach somewhere, live in a country that you want to live in. You don't have to do it forever, but there are so many opportunities oh, to absolutely. really create the life you want to be living while you're still working and while now and give yourself permission to explore that. I love that you brought that up. My most listened to podcast in, of the 80 episodes that are live is on digital nomad it's one of my mm. friends that i mentioned that's still the one that's every week when i look at my analytics three four sometimes ten people have listened to that episode be because she's a digital nomad she's she'll go to tulum she'll go to wherever i don't know quite a few people so older listeners you decide that you're not here's what i'm going to tell you i have lots of clients to do it they'll retire from their job early retirement maybe 55 maybe they'll work to 65 70 they still have a lot of gas in their tank. They still have a lot of knowledge. You can become a digital nomad that consults in your industry using something called a laptop. And you can work two to three hours a week, a day. And then when you're done, put your flip-flops off and go out to the beach. If that's where you're in, you're in a tropical destination. Maybe you're, in, you're living up in the northern country of Canada like myself and it's summertime and you go put your rubber boots on because you're going out fishing, right? It doesn't matter. Quit defining what society has said that you work for 40 years and then you are camped and retired and you're just going to enjoy your grandkids or your own kids or maybe you don't have any kids, maybe you're, which is okay too. Just realize that there's no reason to ever stay capped in life. There's always opportunities to live life to its fullest right till the day of that last breath. 
And the last thing I'll say is you don't know when your last breath is going to be. Mm-hmm. Appreciate the fact that you're even listening to this podcast right now, that you have technology to listen to this podcast, that you're healthy, that you're living life and live your best version of yourself each and every day. Tomorrow's not promised. If you do get a promise tomorrow or a retirement, fantastic. Um, I'm, I could not have said any of that better myself. You are saying things that I believe to my core, and I'm so grateful that you were here telling your listeners all of this. Well, I appreciate having you here because this is our conversations flowing very well. So Kelly, what are the steps to building blocks to evaluating what one needs for fulfillment and enjoyment in their work? Mm, Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, what I really found was when I tried to take little pieces of it by myself, it was never enough. So I have found, and this is the process that I also followed when I was figuring out what work would work for me, that you do need to start with your your core values, your core motivators, that why we've been talking about getting in touch with what's going to motivate you to get up every morning and what's most important to you in, in the world. And that's kind of a compass that you can use to navigate all sorts of career decisions. You also need to really look at your strengths. And I want to be clear, a lot of us think that strengths are anything we can do well. For example, I'm an excellent legal writer. I've been complimented on that for throughout my entire career. And I'm glad I can do that well. It served me well. I did not enjoy legal writing, however. So if if you're good at something, but you don't enjoy it, we don't want to consider that a strength. We want to consider strength, something that you can do well, but that is also energizing for you, something that you enjoy and want to have more of in your life. So we want to take a look at that. We want to look at your unique personality and what kind of boss, what kind of coworkers, what kind of working environment, what kind of corporate culture would enable you to thrive because we don't, even if you're in the right role, if you end up, if you are an introvert working in a very busy open seating plan environment with things coming up left and right that require you to respond without having a chance to think about it, that's probably not going to be a good environment for you. So there are a lot of dimensions to that personality piece we want to look at. We want to look at what you're interested in. I mean, you are going to be spending 40 plus hours of your life working. It's helpful to be working on something that at least interests you. For some people, that could end up being something that's actually a cause that they really care about or a mission that they have. But for other people, it's maybe much more simple. Like, oh, you're working in technology, but you really have no interest in technology. What's a field that maybe you have a little more interest in? I found when I looked at that for me, um, I was very cynical and thought I would have nothing from my interest that informed any direction I would want to go. And then I realized at the very end of when I was working on it that there was this theme running through my interest. And it's that I'm so much of what I consume in my life and look to voluntarily is about personal development and self-growth. And suddenly I realized, oh, this is actually really, really helpful for me to realize. And it absolutely informed my career direction. But we also, and we also want to look at your lifestyle that you want to be leading and what's important to you, because there is a practical element to all of this. So that can include anything from, you know, what, where do you want to be living? Is there a particular city you need to be living in? How many days a week do you want to go into the office? If at all, where do you want to be working from? How long, you know, can your commute be? How much time off do you need? What kind of benefits do you need? Yes, that's where we need to consider paycheck as well, but I like to kind of help people so often if we start thinking about that early on, we cut ourselves off from possibilities that would actually work for us. You can actually make a great living doing things that maybe you don't realize you can make a great living doing. And so we want to bring like those kind of questions about finances in, but I want you to let yourself get dreamy and really get in touch with, you know, what would you want for your ideal lifestyle? Would you want to be a digital nomad? And, you know, after you've kind of gotten in touch with those things, then let's also bring in that, you know, how much money do I really need to be making piece? Yeah, 
you know, you brought up so many good nuggets of information. Listeners, I would rewind and listen to that again. Wow. Core values, strengths, unique personality. What are you interested in your lifestyle? And I wrote some things down for all of those, but, you know, just rewind and listen to that again. Those are all key things. One of the things I really enjoyed about that was, or two things, actually, not that it's all got value, but really struck me was the core value. So many people don't really understand what is their core value? What are your core values? Some people say you have to have eight. Some people say they have to, you have to have five. There's no number on it. What do you, what are your core values? For me, my core values, I had to realize have been the same since I was very young. They've been faith, family, and work. Three simple uh, core values for me, faith, is my first core value. My second is my family. And third, it is work. Because if the other two ain't clicking, guess what? Work, I feel unsatisfied. Why am I working? Hmm. You know, am I just on that hamster wheel going to work, go home, get paid? And, you know, you talked about the fact of, you know, where do you want to work, right? On the, you know, on the, on the lifestyle part of it, where are you going to be living? You're going to have how many days in the office? Do you want to be in an office? All that sort of things is is fine for the work piece. But if I don't have my faith and family solid, it's I find I'm I'm spiraling out of control, living in a rabbit hole. And I may not seem it, but I've been, you mentioned being introvert. I'm extremely an introvert. Mm. I've had to fight to be extroverted when I need to be. Otherwise, I prefer to be in a small, close circle of people because for me to be in large environments after three, four hours in a room of 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, I feel like I am just a shriveled up orange. Yeah, (laughs) It's lost all its moisture and it's got no substance left to it. So I really like the, the fact that you brought that up that most people don't think about many of the things you mentioned, but the core value thing and in the lifestyle you know, and people listening lifestyle to what are you eating? What are you putting yeah. into your body? Right? Are you exercising? Are you doing any of the things? And, and, you know, I have, I have, I won't get into it, but I have severe health issues in my early 50s. But I still try to do things when I'm capable of doing it, going for walks, going for, you know, doing physical activity doesn't mean you have to be out playing baseball or golfing or at the gym. If you, it doesn't mean that any of that's bad. What I'm saying is life can be about the baby steps that fit within your path. And if that's walking or nutrition wise, think about where you are mentally. Sometimes your nutrition is affected and part of me affecting your, your mental state of mind. If all you're eating is processed foods and sugar and drinking too much coffee and you wonder why you're jittery so part of that lifestyle thing of where you're going to work and what you're going to do tie into that your nutrition and exercise and also associations to who you're hanging out with maybe you need to change that a little bit <laughs> and those that li- right yeah. those that listen to my that, that are uh, consistent listeners know i talk about associations and, and people i coach know that i do i I think that is one of the biggest things we don't take serious enough is who we hang out with and, and and associations to food culture of what we were raised with meat and potatoes, you know, improper eating and balancing of our diet, because, you know, we talked about learned behaviors of, you know, jobs and careers and, and what we learn from our families and friends, but we also learn about nutrition we learn about exercise. It's never too late though to change any of that. Right. I constantly elevate though. I read about nutrition. I'm a personal development junkie like you. I love you (laughs) talk listeners. I don't know if you caught that part, but she had the realization that she loved that. Now she does that, Mm -hmm. but she still realizes she needs that. Any good coach and mentor knows they still need that the rest of their lives to keep us in check and balance. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's fun, but I think life in itself is about growth and we are all going to be ideally developing for all of our lives. Um, I really, really love your metaphor that you use about camping versus climbing. I think there's, there are times when we are camped someplace and that's fine, but, oh, we need to keep climbing. Like there are different areas. Maybe we want to be climbing in at different points, but, um, it's really important. 
Oh, absolutely. And, and you know what? People listening and watching this um, episode, you can be camped in life temporarily raising children. Yeah. It doesn't mean, though, that you have to stay camped. So when I say you're camped raising children, you're not necessarily thinking about your rise or your climb. You're camped temporarily. But while you're on that camped journey temporarily, whatever it is, I'm just using children as an example, you can still have good associations. You can still have great nutrition. You can do mm-hmm. some exercise. You can do some personal development because I'm talking from experience. I wasn't doing that. And I slipped into, and I talk about it in my book, I slipped into quiet desperation for many years as a single dad because of the fact that I didn't have coaches and mentors or people telling me you need to read. You need to listen to a good book. If you're not into reading, you need to, what do you, what do you, what kind of shows are you watching? Oh, your kids are going to bed and you're sad and you're watching sappy dramas or you're watching violence or I'm not saying necessarily that's everything I was doing. I'm just using that as an example, but what, what was I putting into my brain? And then the next day was all over again. And I was on that hamster wheel and I was living in quiet desperation. It affects my, affected every aspect of my life. So realizing that, we all can change. I believe in each and every person that is listening or watching this. Kelly does as well. You know, don't hesitate to reach out to Kelly. Um, I think you'd be, you'd be well served to reach out to Kelly. I think you'd get a lot of support and help, especially when you talked about those steps. And it's so imperative. People don't get taken through that journey. Mm -hmm. I'm more focused on, I help people with some of that, but I'm more focused on helping people goal set, do their financial planning and tie their goals to their numbers. Because in my world, I look at it as the fact that if your numbers aren't in place, the rest of that doesn't work. Yeah, because your mind's always camped on the on the numbers, right? Always camped and, and you don't know how to climb out of it. And again, that's back to the same learned behavior we talked about with the education and what we should do with our lives. We say the same broke things, our parents overspent, how could they afford all that stuff? Well, the parents didn't share it. Meanwhile, they were the parents were living in quiet desperation themselves. Yeah. So all the we have so many patterns that we can break and we yeah. can help people through. And again, if we had each if we had each other's as a younger self, could you imagine where we'd be today? <laughs> It'd be amazing. <laughs> so, um, so I love sad. that what I love that what we're also both talking about the ways we help people we're helping them with specific areas, but it's really about helping people have amazing lives. And there are these big pieces that I help people in their work lives, because I think that work is such an important piece of our lives and it spills over into the rest of your life, into your relationships, into your health, into your free time, just how work is going. And I think it's just so important for you know, your overall happiness and flourishing as a human being for the work piece to get figured out. And like what you're talking about with finances and numbers. And, you know, if that's off and your brain is getting stuck on that, it causes so much anxiety and stress. And that's spilling over into so many different areas about your, of your life. And oh, there's just so much of this work that's just about helping you show up and live. I mean, this sounds, this sounds cliche and I don't mean it that way, but live your best life. But really, I think maybe live a flourishing life, be a flourishing human being who's happy and healthy and showing up in the world in the way you want to be showing up. Oh, absolutely. Flourishing. Yeah. Always be climbing. (laughs) Always always be be climbing. climbing. (laughs) Right. And again, it's just words, whatever resonates with, with people, it's climbing, flourishing. One of the things that the word we've used a lot is relationships. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that we, as people that want to help and serve others, are always looking for ourselves. We're looking for solid, concrete, good relationships. And we are also trying to do and working successfully in many cases, developing those relationships because vulnerability is so key in helping people not stay camped, to flourish, to be able to climb. And people nowadays are so um, against being vulnerable because they're always thinking that it's going to get used against them. Listeners, we ourselves, as a good coach, mentor, um, person that wants to help others, we're never going to use your vulnerability against you. We're going to use it to help you discover 
that you are worthy, that you, you know, all the noise you've had in your life, all the people that have tried labeling you and putting you into a compartment that you have to, that you think you have to stay in it, you don't. Mm -hmm. There's people out there that are willing to listen, that are willing to help you discover Kelly's doing it one way, I'm doing it another. We actually really, when I, the more we converse, and you probably realize that yourself, listeners, we are a great fit. We're the yin and yang of how we can help out. I can help out on one end, Kelly can help out the other. My point for this is I know people, myself included, I have more than one coach. I have a coach that helps me out on my on development of my speaking and my book. I have a coach that helps me out as an entrepreneur to think differently about the different paths of where I'm looking at expanding my brand of give a heck. I have the list goes on. So you can have more than one coach too. If you're lucky enough to find a coach that can encompass all of that. Good, good for you. I haven't found it yet. I, I find that everybody has different strengths, right? So Kelly, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? Mm, that's such a great question. I, w- I would tell them to, you know, I think I might actually pause and echo the advice you would give to your younger self and really take a moment to, you know, so many people are so busy. They're on that hamster wheel, especially when it comes to work and you're just meeting the deadlines and doing all the things and rushing to get home to your kids and just busy, busy, just trying to keep up would be pause and check in with yourself and ask yourself, you know, how am I actually feeling about my life? How am I feeling about my work? How do I feel in the middle of the workday? How do I feel at the end of the workday? Is this really what I want for my life? And really just pay attention to how your body reacts, but create some deliberate space to let yourself feel the things you're feeling. Maybe you are really happy and giving yourself more space to feel that and recognize that and appreciate it is wonderful maybe some anger is going to come up and that's really important to pause and notice maybe some sadness or discontent, maybe that tightness in your chest or in your gut, but just really creating a little bit of space to ask yourself some questions about, huh, is, how is this going? Is this really what I want? How am I feeling about it? is I think the most important thing. And if, you know, you're having a negative reaction, if you're noticing that anger, that sadness and depression, even let yourself feel it because those feelings are just signals that something needs to change and letting yourself tune into your body signals gives yourself the opportunity to get what it is that you really want and make that happen. That's an amazing closing message. And to add to that, if any way along that process anybody's ever making you feel bad for you how you feel if you're sharing it with others back to the fact of what I mentioned earlier maybe you need to check your associations right because it's okay to internalize to feel to question because our brain does not know the difference between the lie and the truth you are the person that's going to program your brain by what you tell it And if you've been telling yourself that you're satisfied and all of a sudden one day you realize you're not, that's okay. Yes, you're going to feel some anxiety because now you're uncertain about your future, but that's okay. I'm here to tell you it's okay, right? So I appreciate the fact, you know, take a moment, check in with yourself. I agree with that 1000%. This has been an amazing conversation. I so appreciate this. So our time is almost up and I want to respect our listeners and your time. However, before we end, can you please tell the listeners what's the best way to reach you? You know, you can go to my website. It's www.kellyshields.com. My email address is there, which is simply kelly at kellyshields.com. You can actually feel free to shoot me an email if you'd like. That's great. Check out my website for like what I'm putting out into the world, any articles or podcast appearances that might have some great content, or if you'd want to work with me, I'm also on Instagram as at Kelly Shields underscore. Um, I'm not as active there as I maybe used to be, but you can still find me there. 
I will add your website is rarely well put up, right? Mm -hmm. So it, you can go in there, listeners, and you can read, go to the, click the about button. And it's, some of the things we touched on today and talked about are in there. How do I know that? Because I read it, right? <laughs> because I do give a heck. And I want to understand what it is that I'm putting out into the world, whether it's from my podcast or just presenting outside in, in a, on a daily. So I appreciate you for being on the show Check out the website, listeners. I'll make sure it's on all the information and how to link up with uh, Kelly. will be at giveaheck.com. Hit the podcast portal button and you'll be able to check out Kelly's um, website and reach out to her and email her as well. So thanks so much for being on Give a Heck, Kelly. I appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn it is never too late to give a heck. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com and until next time together let us all strive to give a heck